the truth of the matter is that I wasn't very well, economically well off, and I wanted, I wanted to make some of myself. I mean, that's, that's part of being an American citizen. Uh, I had a drive to become successful. But after my accident, my whole attitude changed. It completely changed. And my attitude was, you got to give it back, and give it back in a very nice, intelligent, well thought out way. And I did that. I've been doing it ever since. I was born in 1921, and by the time I was eight or nine years old, we had a depression. And once we had the depression, uh, things took it in a different twist than normal. Uh, you uh, were very cautious about what money you spent because you didn't have any money in the first place. And uh, I came from a family that were wonderful people, but they, my dad was not really a uh, good businessman. He's a wonderful dad and marvel father and a Swedish man in the world. And a wonderful grandfather and a wonderful great grandfather and all those things. But he was not uh, a successful businessman. Anyway, so we were a generation that lived in depression and right out of the depression we all went into World War II. We came out of World War II and I think this is true, a lot of us, uh, we had great aspirations. Um, I, I, I was in the Navy five years. I said, how am I gonna make a living? You know? And I wanna really make a living. I really wanna move into a different end of life. I met Arlene and she was beautiful and lovely and we hit it off right away. And we met in, uh, October and November, and we got engaged in January, and we got married in June. And we've been married 65 years. I think it's pretty good. I had four uh, operations in two days. They went in, they opened us all up, and they got it. finally got the whole thing out. It was like this, a grapefruit. Uh, uh, a little envelope sit in bed. and I went into a coma and this little young lady who I love very much and her sister sat right by my side for about two weeks as I was recovering. They, I, I was in a coma but they were playing music, they were doing a wonderful thing. Uh, no question helped me and I came to after a while the doctor said to my wife, he says, I don't think he's going to live, but if he lives, he's going to be a vegetable. I can almost assure you of that. So if you better take care of your uh, economic, uh, financial things. So she started working with some of my financial people, and um, I came to him. Don't ask me. I, I missed... Uh, a, affecting my uh, uh, mental abilities to have inductive reasoning, deductive reasoning, memory and all that. And what I didn't have was the ability to walk and talk like a baby. You know, you have to learn all that. But that's, that was a hell of a lot easier than the other. And so well, that came back. But when I first came to, I couldn't sit up straight. I'd fall right over and uh, I, I couldn't talk to anybody, I mumbled, and uh, I could hardly see because uh, my eyes were this far apart, and I couldn't hear. So I was in pretty bad shape. So I decided I can't live like this. I got to get back. So I started uh, going around the track at the uh, high school uh, with a nurse holding on the back of me. I told her she lost 22 pounds. <laughs> her husband thought that she was great. And uh, I started to jog. 
and pretty soon I had a jacket. And I kept that up almost every day until I finally got back. And with those days, you didn't have uh, health clubs and things, you know. And I started going to one of the first ones they had and uh, get myself involved. And that's, that's how it happened. Uh, I, I kept on going more and more and more till I got back. And I didn't play tennis anymore, I saw three balls. I played golf, and I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I was in a ball here and there. I first started taking lessons, and now I'm fairly good. You're fairly good. She was great. She is great. Um, I had uh, tickets to the Northwestern game. Uh, I had no money. But uh, another guy and I bought tickets. We couldn't go to the Bears, because the Northwestern was pretty cheap in those days. So we had tickets to the Northwestern game. Northwestern was playing Michigan, and uh, so we went over to the 85 house for a cup of coffee later. And I'm walking down the aisle, and I see uh, Arlene's sister, Lori Welk, her name was. She married, married a fellow who was a doctor and uh, pre med at, North, at North, in Michigan, and she was in Northwestern, so they went to the game. And she said, um, Hi, Marshall. She said, I'd like to meet my sister. There's a damn cute gal. And I said, oh, my. And we started talking. And then I was with my cousin and another gal, very smart. So she said, let me handle it. And she went over to Arlene and she said, are you busy tonight? And I looked at her. I don't know, why do you ask? Well, the guy over there, he, he's, he's sort of bashful. He'd like to take you out. She said, well, I have a date, but uh, thank you anyway. That was the last she said about it. On Monday, I called her up, and I asked her for a date. If, little did I know she was going around with a guy almost exclusively on Saturday nights. So, um, every, I would call her on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, ask her about Saturday night. By that time, she was all booked up. So finally, after about three times, uh, I, it was the last time I was going to call her, I said, doggone it, she's a cute guy, I like to take her out. So I said, um, how about Saturday night? She says, you know, I told my um, date that my mother wanted me to do something because I was hoping you'd call. I said, okay. So I called her and took her out. I said, I'll meet you downtown. She said, oh, no, you won't. She said, you're going to get your car and drive and pick me up. I don't go meet him guys downtown. She said, I said, okay. So I took her out, and we went to the Standard Club because it was a, an engagement party for a friend of mine. And uh, we were dancing away, and he says to me, he says, you two ought to get married. You're the cutest couple. <laughs> I said, Mary, <laughs> it's the first day I ever had with her. <laughs> uh, put an idea in my mind, though. <laughs> and then the second day, I took her out, and it was a stormy, cold day. And I said, I've got two tickets for her, and he gets your gun. So she said, OK, I'd like to go with it, and he gets your gun. And uh, I went to pick her up. I couldn't get the car started. So I pushed it while she started. Then I ran in front and got in the car. And went downtown. I, again, I didn't have any money. So uh, she said, we're going to be late for the theater. I said, she said, why don't you go in the garage? I said, garage, a bucket and a half. I haven't got a bucket and a half. <laughs> so I pushed one car uh, one way and one another. I squeezed myself in, went on up. We were in the last row, and there's a pose there, and I was sitting in front of the pose. I never saw any get you here. She did. 15 or 20 years later, we have children, we have a home, I've done pretty well, we're, we're having fun, and uh, we're talking, and someone said, did you ever see Annie get you again? She said, well, I liked it so well, I saw it twice. I said, you saw it twice. That's 15 years later. She said, oh, I forgot to tell you. She says, 
And Joe took me out, and we sat at Seven's Rose Center. His father, Joe Levy's name, had a Chrysler dealer place, and he had drive a brand new Chrysler convertible, and she sat in front with me. She had beat up old eight-year-old Chevy, and uh, couldn't get it started. And he said, in fact, I don't know why she ever went out with me. But we kept going out, and here we are. We've been married 65 years. Well, first of all, you got to be honest, right? And you got to tell them the truth. And I mean, tell them the truth. You can't locate in that occasion, because what you make can't be sold there, okay? But you can't locate there. That building's got, oh, come, blah, 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 or this. You got to tell them, tell them, you know, tell them what's bad, too. You know, if you don't want to tell a guy what's good, then he's not going to listen to you anyway. Some guys don't know how to, they don't know how to be honest. You got to be, let me give you three other examples and I'll, I'll quit, okay. Um, when I was in business for about five days, um, a fellow comes up to me, he says, I wanted to buy this block uh, here, but there's an alley in between. I want to kill an alley so I can build a big building. So I went to the alderman, Polish guy, and he says, alley, yeah, that's $500. I said, what $500? He says, you got to pay me $500 so I can get you clear of the alley. I said, wait a minute, I ain't going to give you any money. If I give you money, they'll, they'll be on my... I remember when I was a kid, you said the hobo would put an X on the door and you he go, because that guy was a fall guy. I said, I'm not going to be a fall guy and have my reputation ruined because of 500 bucks. Desire to build industrial parks, but there weren't any. They were industrial districts and very heavy industries. Jerry Blakely, of Boston, who was the head of Cabot, Captain Forbes, came up with the conceptual idea that it should be a park-like environment and it should be compatible industry. It didn't make a lot of noise, it didn't uh, smell bad, it didn't do anything like that. And they um, uh, incorporated that in what's called the New England Industrial Park. I went out there and studied it I wanted to put a certain company of in the pharmaceutical business. I made a plant for them in Chicago, and I wanted to build for them in in, in uh, pardon me in Boston. And uh, I um, were imbued with this idea of a park. Uh, I've discussed this in the development of Centex in other conversation we've had, so I have to tell that old story again, but we took Centex, we put 1,500 buildings and uh, 2,500 acres uh, at the western edge of O'Hare International Airport. It was the largest park, uh, two miles by three miles, 2,500 acres, almost nine square miles. Uh, into a industrial park where we had hotels, we had restaurants, we had daycare operation, we had all these various things, and uh, it was extremely successful. After the third year, we we're making a deal a week, and uh, our owners, as I told you before, were Clint Merkinson out of Dallas and uh, the Prisker family in Chicago. And A. M. Prisker would go to Wall Street and he says, we're making a deal a week here. And of course they got everybody excited and, and we got all kinds of references. So as a result, we started building in eight, eight states. And some were good, some were bad. Uh, Denver is the best example where Samsonite luggage came to us and said, we need, you have 600 acres, we want to take 100 acres, we don't want to pay you a nickel more than you're paying. I said, you want me to sell land at my cost? He says, yeah. He said, but I'll tell you what, we're in 40 to 60 suppliers who build all around us at, and buy it at retail. It was the smartest thing we ever did. We sold the thing out in four years. 
You never take 600 acres on sale in four years. As a result, the Union Pacific came along and wanted to buy our company. I didn't want to sell the company, but I thought it was a very nice thing because they were across the street and they had two deals and we had maybe 40 or 50 of them. So it, it turned out very pleasantly. But I, I could give you some bad things that didn't work out, but I'm not going to tell you what they are. <laughs> anyway, um, I, uh, in the middle of all this, or try, uh, after we built the uh, Syntex operation, um, was kayaking in, uh, in uh, Idaho, where I lived, I had a summer or winter home, and uh, I got caught in a, what's called a haystack, and I was head down in the, uh, against a rock, and I evidently broke a blood vessel in my head. It's called a subdural hematoma. And my friend Stephen Wynn, who was very famous for uh, Las Vegas, took me, looked at me, and he says, I think you're dying. He said, I'm going to take you back to Chicago. Took me to Chicago, I came back to Chicago, and they found out that I had a subdural hematoma, and uh, I had four operations, and that wrist story I've told before. I suppose so. I, I, you look, I, I, you know what this reminds me of? An oracle sitting on top of a mountain, and people come up to him and say, how did you do this? Well, that's bullshit, you know? <laughs> I'm not an oracle. I've just been lucky, because I happen to really think out of the box, and think, how do you make, I don't know how to make this guy happy. How do we get this thing closed? How do we make both parties happy? If, you know, if, if we, when you were make deals we didn't know, but when deals we did, I, I knew all our problems, so I knew what to ask. And uh, we made um, 1,500 deals in our park. We built 1,500 buildings. That's a lot of buildings. Only one out of 1,500 failed. Only one did we have to hit the guy for money and take his deposit. Everybody else came through. Now, that's pretty damn good. One of the first thing is that I invited seven people to come over to my house in Sun Valley who were all leaders in real estate. They were all in their 40s and what have you. 50s, uh, Sam Zell, uh, uh, Ken Leventhal, uh, George Arvis. These are names that we know in the business. You people may not know them. Uh, and uh, we had a meeting that lasted until about 3 in the morning. Someone said, let's do it again. We've done it again and again and again in Sun Valley. We've done it in Aspen. We did it in California, and we've now brought it to Chicago. And uh, we've done it 35 consecutive years, never missed a year. And now it's called the Marshall Bennett Classic, and it's run, uh, financed, and uh, really led by Sam Zell, who's now become a very illustrious developer and who has bought the Chicago uh, Waldorf Astoria, and uh, it's run, led by Peter Lindman, who is the man who bought real estate to Wharton and made it one of the greatest real estate schools in the United States, and who helped us get started. Most important thing in my uh, experience is creating a school of real estate, because when Louis and I started, we made a lot of mistakes. There were no such things in the MBA. And in Chicago, is the biggest transactional city in the United States, perhaps in the country, in, in the world. And therefore, we felt there should be a very good real estate school. So I went to the University of Chicago, which was my alma mater, and they threw me out. And the dean said, we don't believe in real estate as an art or as a science. And we're not so sure it's even legitimate. And I went to Northwestern, 
and the dean there, who I know very well, said to me, we preach, teach securitization. That's going to be the next greatest thing in the world. I said, what is securitization? He says, we take mortgages, we bundle them together, and we chop them, we sell this to this. I said, uh, that, that doesn't sound good to me. Well, that was the start of the recession, if you will. And uh, I don't think he's selling securitization anymore. related to the real estate industry. And I'm really down in the dumps about it. And I was attending a luncheon, and sitting next to me, the fellow asked me what I do. I told him I'm in the real estate business, but I've had a, a very um, very uh, unhappy uh, attention of trying to get some university to build a real estate school. He said, you want to build a real estate school? He said, I've always wanted to build a real estate school myself. I said, well, what do you do? He said, I'm the president of Roseville University. My name is Ted Gross. And so I uh, invited uh, Peter Lindman, who happened to be in Chicago, to come over with me. And we sat down and we developed a school. We raised $11 million. And uh, we hired a professor from North, uh, from uh, Harvard and a professor from Yale. And then we had 12 uh, adjunct professors, people who were in law or in business practice as uh, professors in their profession. And we developed two uh, degrees. Uh, one is a master in business administration in real estate which is an overall view of real estate, but really is not for the practitioner. Then we developed what's called MRED, which is a Master's in Real Estate Development, and where you learn how to be a contractor, an architect. We don't learn how to be an architect. We learn what the architect's position is in real estate. And uh, it's been very successful. Uh, we've won some contests where we beat beaten Wharton, which makes me feel very good. But there are 200 real estate uh, schools in the United States, and we've been rated number 10. And for a school that's only 12 years old, we've been 10 out of 200 is pretty good. And we think uh, we're on the right track. And I met uh, my friend Lou Kahnweiler, who I'd known in school, and uh, he said, uh, I'm going to law school in the spring, in the summer, uh, fall, uh, and uh, I'm working in the industrial real estate business. I said, what's that? He says, well, you sell factories to people. I said, well, that's a good idea, because if you sell factories uh, to uh, the president, he, maybe I can get a job in labor relations. So um, I tried to do this as intelligent as possible. I looked up who's who and found out there are three people in Chicago that appeared in Who's Who in America. And I went to see all three of them. And the third one was William Hart. And uh, he was the King Queen of them all. That's why I saved him for last. And uh, he looked at me and said, you know something? And I was still wearing my Navy uniform, so he was impressed. He said, uh, my son was supposed to come back here and take over the business but uh, he's not around. He went to work for the Indian Reserve, Re Reservation people. And uh, I'd like to get a young guy with me because all of us are pretty old. He was 65 and the rest of them looked like they were 102. So um, I went to work and it was a lot of fun, but I had lunch every day with Lou Kamler. After a year, we said we're going to be in business for ourselves. And I think if you talk about legacy, um, I think the school is probably the best thing, and it, it, it's the most exciting thing for me. I think building Centex was a great experience, and building in, in eight states was a great experience. Uh, we built 26 industrial parks all together, uh, some good, some bad, like everything else. You know, there's a saying in the Bible that 
you, you go from defeat to defeat and finally you, you go to something positive. Um, if you've been defeated enough times. Uh, I would think that the legacy is the Marshall Bennett uh, classic, which is the meeting of all these uh, leaders of industry in real estate, uh, and the continuity of that, which will probably go on, and the school, which no question will go on, and uh, the fact that we built something of the nature and size of Sunday. Uh, that's a pretty good legacy. When I was a little kid, my father loved opera. I don't like opera between you and me. My father loved opera, and Ravinia had only opera in those days. <clears throat> Ravinia was set up as a uh, little um, play every merry-go-round and all that stuff so that the people would take the North Shore out and then they maybe be interested in buying a piece of land in, in Manetka or Island Park, Lake Forest, whatever. That was the idea of the electric line. And then when the Northwestern went through, it sort of killed that. Ravin was established for that reason. And then they built a shed and they only had opera. And that was when I was seven or eight years old. My dad loved opera, so we'd go there, and I sat there picking up bottle caps and whatever, you know. <laughs> I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I certainly learned to like it. I learned to like classical music, and uh, during the war, I was stationed in areas like Boston, where I could get, you know, I was a Navy, a Navy officer, so the officer's club would give us free tickets, or Tanglewood, or the here in in Boston or the Philadelphia Orchestra under Ormandy and the guys like that. You know, you get to like it after a while. So when I started to make a dollar here and there, I said, come on, Arlene, let's go. And she loves it too. She likes it even better than I do. So, uh, and, and Bija loves it and Alice loves it. So uh, we all love music. Beach was born, and uh, four months later we moved into a house in Island Park, and we witnessed a fire burn down Ravinia, burn the whole thing down. I'm standing there looking, and I went out to see it. Guy says, "You know much about music?" I says, "I love music." He says, you do? And we're just two guys. He says, um, I'm um, either chairman or some of the board of Ravinia. I said, what's your name? He says, Stan Freely. And he says, how would you like to go on the board? <laughs> Stand there, and that was the fire. And I said, okay, sure. I didn't know what the hell I was getting into. And I got on the board, and I was, never got off for 50 years because every time my term was up, they'd make me an officer, and then they'd take it away from me, and I started all over again. So I never left him. Now I'm a life trustee. Uh, so I love Ravinia. Eddie Gordon and I became very close friends. And uh, when they built the uh, shed that's on there now, uh, we, we played a big role. And then when he said, we have to have a school, I said, well, I'm not gonna give you a million bucks for that school. First of all, they don't have it. And secondly, yeah, that's a lot of dope. I'll give you half a million dollars to, to build a concert hall. Well, it cost more than half a million. But you know, it, it, it was the, the major part of the money. So we built it, and they called it Bennett Hall. So I said, I owe this to Eddie Gordon. And he, he, he we had a party uh, for the opening, and uh, I said, this is a gift for me to my wife for her 40th anniversary. It was her 40th anniversary that day. And he had Gil Shaham, who was 16 years old, play Flight of the Bumblebee. I 
I think luck plays an often important part, but, but uh, if, for, the harder you work, the luckier you are, you know? <laughs> and uh, we worked plenty hard. I was down in the office at seven in the morning, every morning I stayed down to six at night, uh, just banging away. Uh, we make telephone calls, we call on people. We did things that the ordinary uh, fellow in the business doesn't do because he assumes that his reputation follows him. For instance, today there are maybe half a dozen very large brokerage firms, CBRA, a Coldwell Banker, Richard Ellis, um, uh, our firm now, which is Kaiser's, um, Kushner and Wakefield, um, Robin Ellis, and things of the firm. But they're all established firms now. But there, none of those people were in existence when we started. There were only seven firms in the industrial estate business in Chicago, and they were all firms that started in the 20s. And the people that were running them were in their trying. And when I first went to work, I worked for a fellow that started in 1915. Well, 1915, I wasn't born yet, so I know. Uh, what I'm saying is that the um, if, if you put on this earth, uh, you ought to make a contribution to your family to your community, to society, that improves the world better than if you weren't there. In other words, you got to make a little contribution, I don't care what it is. Uh, and if you do that, if everybody did that, we'd have a much better world. I mean, we wouldn't have uh, the murders that you see in the United States that just killed 12 people. And, the Navy Yard in Washington, we had murders here. The, the, the thing that happened in uh, Connecticut uh, with uh, five-year-old kids, uh, that shouldn't be tolerated, really. And I think that there are so many good things that can be done. And if we sh at least have the attitude we're willing to do it, and have been lucky to make some money and philanthropically help them. Uh, I think that's what it's all about. Oh, without question, Jay Pritzker, A. Pritzker, the whole grand, Jack Pritzker. Um, when I uh, had the accident, uh, uh, Jack Pritzker had a stroke. And two of us were having lunch, and a person comes in, and he sits down we're in their library, and they serve some lunch. He says to me, I've now listened to you people for one half an hour, and I don't understand one word you've said. You know, we're going to talk. <laughs> Those people, without question, uh, Abe loved me. He didn't love me well enough to make me a fourth son, but. He really loved me, and we would sit and talk for hours. I don't know what the word mentoring means. What we do is sit down and have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with people. What do you really want out of life? Why are you taking a course in real estate? What brought you to this thing? And what do you want to do about this that? What should we be looking out for? What are the dangers? What are the benefits? Uh, how can you make a living doing this? How can you move up the ladder in business? And that, if that's mentoring, I guess that's what we do. Uh, 
I asked Peter Lindman, who really knows this stuff better than anyone else, I said, Peter, who are the 10 or 15 finest people who had an impact on our industry? And uh, Sam said, well, that question. Um, Steve Roth of Bernardo, well, that question. David Simon of Simon Properties, uh, the large uh, people in the, uh, the mall, but um, Blackstone, which is probably the largest investor. And uh, when you get done with those guys, I remember guys like Trammell Crowe out of Dallas, or Jerry Hines, which I, he's still living and he's a good guy and he's a good friend of mine. And, and you know, you, you get mixed up. And Jerry and I are now, not quarreling, but trying to synthesize who we should talk to and what we should say. He's a writer, I'm not. But I'm, I'm gonna do the chasing and he'll do the, 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 man, uh, the ready. I have no idea. I didn't do this for legacy. I did just because I wanted to do it. Uh, I suppose the school is a good example. I think the, the classic having these people come around uh, who are the presidents of major companies. Uh, Sam Zell made the comment, and he's a pretty tough guy, that uh, some guys make their experience and their legacy out of brick and mortar, you make it out of ideas. He says, creating this thing, he said, is something I have never would have thought of doing. He took over after I did it for 16 years. Uh, the school, I says, way beyond me. It's gone way beyond me. And that I owe to John DeVries and people of that nature, Jerry Fogelson, who's a remarkable man. And, uh, well, and you've talked to most of these fellas. Peter Lindman, if it wasn't for Peter, we'd never have a school. Cause he was the head of all real estate for uh, Wharton. He had me in town, and I asked him, as my friend, come over and talk to the president of Roosevelt. He showed him the fellow of the Wharton uh, curriculum. He said, fellow of the fact that you've raised, had the thing going for 30 some years, well, at that time it was 20 some years. He says, I think I can raise the money for you. And we raised 11 million bucks in a hurry. So, you know, and it, for Roosevelt, who never had much money, it seemed to work out. So, what was the question about the legacy? I suppose that's the legacy. I was making money, I was saving money, I was doing what I thought was right, but I wasn't really doing the right thing. First thing I did was to build Bennett Hall, which became Bennett Gordon Hall, which your mother-in-law is very active in. And the second thing, we created a chair in neurosurgery at Evanston Hospital, which has become really important. It has worth between two and a half and three million dollars now. I didn't give that much to, but they've been building it up. And I've been doing that ever since. And then I went on the hospital board here, went on the hospital board there, and so I was on four hospital boards, including Weitzman in, uh, in Rehova in Israel. So, um, although as time went on, uh, America got a little more friendly to the minority population, Jewish or whatever. I can recall going to University of Chicago with a 
uh, quarter complex. If you went Northwestern, you couldn't get in unless you were really pretty good. And uh, in Chicago, to get a scholarship, it was pretty tough. But um, today, the president of Northwestern is Jewish. All three of them were less. The president of Chicago was Jewish. The president of Harvard was Jewish. The president of Yale was Jewish. The president of, uh, of a smaller school, uh, California. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's really funny because there was a time when you would be shocked if that happened. And so well, that came back. But when I first came to, I couldn't sit up straight. I'd fall right over, and uh, I, I couldn't talk to him. I mumbled, and uh, I could hardly see because uh, my eyes were this far apart, and I couldn't hear. So I was in pretty bad shape. So I decided I can't live like this. I got to get back. So I started uh, going around the track at the uh, high school with a nurse holding on the back of me. I told her she lost 22 pounds. <laughs> her husband thought that she was great. And uh, I started to jog, and pretty soon I was jogging. And I kept that up almost every day until I finally got back. And with those days, you didn't have uh, health clubs and things, you know. And I started going to one of the first ones they had and uh, get myself involved. And, and that's that's how it happened. And I, I kept on doing more and more and more till I got back. And I didn't play tennis anymore, I saw three balls. I played golf, and I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I was in a ball here and there. I first started taking lessons, and now I'm fairly good. Just fairly good. Yeah, I suppose so. I'm a happy guy. I really am. I think I am anyway. I don't know if my family would agree with that, but I think I am. And happiness is a wonderful thing. It means you gotta love someone. You gotta love your wife. You gotta love your kids. You gotta love your grandchildren. And I mean, with love, I mean, you gotta put up when you have to. You support them when you have to. Not that you have to, but you want to. Yeah, I think that's a great thing. And uh, I've enjoyed, I, I, our, our grandchildren, um, my daughter's niece and nephew, my other daughter's daughter, uh, kids, are wonderful kids, and they're gonna be so very successful in life. And I'm just getting a big kick out of both of them. Uh, we were a small family, there's only seven of us all together, so uh, we don't make up a big crowd. Um, but I, I think the part of it is giving back. What I want to achieve, I just want to. I'd like to make this a better world than it is. I love Chicago. I think Chicago, I think Richard Daly made Chicago an international city. Now, corruption still existed. It exists today as it did before. Rahm Emanuel is trying to cure that. I don't think he has the charisma that Rich Daly had. He's a darn smart guy, and I think he doesn't stand for any monkey business. Uh, we still have a reputation of being uh, uh, criminally active. Uh, shootings went forth in July, 70 some people were killed. I think this is terrible. 
I really do. I, I don't see how that can exist with the growth of making this a big city. When you walk down Michigan Avenue, you can hear all kinds of conversation, German, French, what have you. A lot of people come here. And Chicago is becoming a destination for visitors from all over the United world, and, uh, which I like. I have the, and this is a beautiful city. It's, uh, I think that Rich Daly went out of his way to make it a beautiful city. And I think that uh, there's no question Rahm Emanuel's continuing making beautiful city. <laughs>